Today we are going to need a lot of thermal paste. So we are doing thermal compound application methods on Threadripper using the 1950X specifically. The video will show you using a piece of plexiglass how the thermal paste spreads when we depress it onto the IHS. And then we're gonna look at how it spreads once a cold plate is applied to it through actual mounting force as normally. And finally, at the end of the video, we're gonna look through the results, which ones perform better if there's any appreciable difference at all. And this was partly inspired by an older video of Der Bauer's, so we're uh, borrowing his methodology with one of these, which it's not perfect. You're not using the same force to mount this thing as you would a cooler, but that's why we're expanding on it by also mounting a cooler, and then we'll show you before and after. Before getting to those, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and their 1080 Ti SC2, which we've recommended fairly highly for its build quality and uh, the ICX sensors, which are kind of fun to play with. You can check our full SC2 review for the 1080 Ti if you're curious to learn more, or you can click the link in the description below to find the product page for the 1080 Ti SC2. And because AMD gave some outlets permission to go ahead and post thermal results already, we figured it'd be okay if we went ahead and posted some of ours for something that matters quite a lot for you as a DIY builder, which is thermal paste application. So we're looking through that. Threadripper is interesting because of its die layout. And this is something we showed in our initial video where we show the location of the dies and how distant they are from the center. So it's not like what you'd normally expect with a traditional heat spreader and die where it's right in the center of the thing. Okay, so here's what we're gonna go with. I have six methods here that I've drawn on the paper. And the first one, number one, is actually what AMD is recommending for their application. So they're showing five kind of small to medium sized dots in the corners. So you hit the dies here, and remember only two dies are active. So you might have these two or these two. The other two are silicon substrate interposers that are just spacers. The next is a modified version of what we've been using, which is just basically road lines across the dies. And then uh, what we're actually doing is this right now, but that may change after these results. So we're doing like a dotted road, basically. Uh, this is your traditional dot, an X, and then just hand spreading it by hand across the whole thing. And just as a reminder, here is the chip that we, or the IHS that we drew on with dry erase marker as a reminder, since some people found this highly offensive. Uh, so the IHS we drew on shows you the die location. You've got uh, two of these active and two inactive. We don't know which ones. And that's what we want to cover. So our objective is to cover this. If we flash back to the footage of the default Ace Attack thermal paste, we already know how that applies. And it only really covers uh, maybe like half of the die area. The cold plate covers the whole thing. It barely covers these outer edges, but the thermal paste did not. So we're gonna look into that with this video. Let's go ahead and start this off. As you can see with this uh, drawn on one, we have the plexiglass one or whatever it is, polycarbonate, whatever, matching up pretty much dead on. So we're gonna use this to push down and let's actually just start with method number four which is the traditional dot in the middle method. And I'm just gonna go ahead and put a check mark here. So we're doing the plexiglass one first. So here is what we're looking at. And this first one, I'm gonna do a big dot right there on the Z, which is dead center of everything. This is a pretty traditional way to apply thermal paste. So it's reasonable to expect people would continue doing this if they don't know what's underneath the IHS. We're gonna go a bit bigger than normally and normally you might stop somewhere around there if you're working with a smaller Intel chip or something. We're gonna just do a, a glorified version of that. I mean, that's still a pretty good amount of thermal paste. Let's do a little bit more. Okay, so a giant die right in the middle, or a blob rather, not die. And which side is this drawn on? Do you know? Okay, so here we go. Let's just kind of line it up and Not getting much here. And as you force more pressure, of course, it will spread a bit more, which we'll see that once we start applying the cold plate with the socket correctly with the screws. But that's what we're getting right now. It's just... Can't spread out much more than that. So 
I think that's pretty much where we stand. So that's what the blob gets you. Now, if we look at the dies, we're not covering a whole lot here. We get about half of each of them. That's going to be suboptimal transfer. You might be fine, you know, if the cold plate's still touching these outer areas, you're still pulling heat off of them. But this isn't about being fine. It's about what's the most efficient. That's what we're looking into today. May be the case that it's totally irrelevant. We'll find out in the results section. Now to clean this off. Next one we're going to do is the, uh, let's go with the AMD recommended method. So they're doing a dot right around here in the middle. And let's also assume that they're putting the others in the middle of the die location. So this is going to be between the E and the N. Okay, that's also a pretty good size. Those are all pretty, I think we may have done a bit more here than the AMD does in their, uh, their media recommended version, but I think we might need more. Try not to apply too much torsional force here. So something like that is what we end up with which if you did a bit bigger dots, you'd actually, you would cover all the dies. So that might not be a bad method, bigger dots than we did, but overall not bad. We'll test it and see how it does. Let's move on. Next one, let's do the line method. Not the one we've been using, but one pretty close to it. So we're gonna do a line from the A to the N, T to the R, and this is not, are we doing that in the middle of these or what? Uh, kind of the bottom of the A, kind of the middle of the T, okay. And these are, uh, are going to stick out from under the cold plate, sort of. They'll, they'll definitely bleed out from under the cold plate of an Azatec cooler. Okay, here we go. The real test is going to be once we get the cooler on here. All right, so by hand, that's pretty good. That's about where, it's about as far as we're gonna get. So that one looks good. It's the best looking so far. We've covered all the dies. We're not doing full IHS contact. If you're mounting a smaller cooler to it anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, that's what that's what we're looking at with this one, which actually this makes it kind of look like the next method is not gonna matter. Okay, next one, I'm out of paste, I think, on the first tube. It's all the same paste though. So next one, let's do the same thing just with the uh, dots in the middle, which really almost feels pointless, but. Pretty much the same. It spreads out a little farther on the sides, but the two lines for the road does just as well as the dots in the middle. Two more methods to do with this one. Let's do an X. All right, X, how's it go? Let's see. I should have figured that out sooner. It makes it, <laughs> makes it easier for the camera to see what's going on when I push more force onto it. All right. Okay. So not great. It could work if you used more compound than I did, but as you can see over here, we don't have full coverage. Pretty good everywhere else, honestly. So basically the, the lesson is just make sure you're at the right height at the starting point. So you could bypass that by just doing a dot in the middle of the R and a dot in the middle of the N to make sure you cover everything. But not bad overall. Okay, so a uh, bit much on the thermal paste, you know, kind of unavoidable. I think I have some up here too. Probably do one of the footballer things. But um, yes, uh, that's a quick look at it. We're going to do something more proper now with a, an actual CLC. Apply that to it. Wait. Okay, yeah, that hand's okay. <laughs> Apply an actual CLC to it with real proper mounting pressure that's more even across the, uh, 
even across the die area and across the IHS. Then we'll get into testing, see how it goes with less compound used for that one spreading method. But so far, what we've learned is the X method looks okay. So X is looking okay right here. And then uh, let's do a note. Good. Uh, this one was okay. This one, not so good. And this one is like excessive. These are my notes for later uh, compared to number two. So that's what we're going to test. Let's do the uh, cold plate stuff and then move on to testing. So we finished applying all the thermal paste. We did a couple different variants. So there was one variation of the blob method where basically did a small and a large and then a slightly larger large blob because those were yielding interesting results. So we did those instead of the full coverage thermal paste spread, basically removed that one from the equation. And honestly, I think that one will make more sense with something like the Noctua full coverage plates anyway, because right now, if you manually apply thermal paste to cover the entire IHS with one of these Azatec coolers, you're not going to use a lot of the compound that's on there anyway. So it just kind of sits there and not sure whether it helps or hurts, but we had other things to test. So ax to that one, but had plenty of other cool ones to work with. And we got photos comparing the different application methods after the cooler was removed too. Here's how it ended up looking in the photos. These images show the application after the cooler was torqued down fully, run through our burn-in testing and then removed. This has a huge, your mileage may vary element to it. So don't take any of these as hard fact. It will always be this way. Take them as this is how it would be if you applied it the way we did. These will obviously change with each application because you're just going to either use slightly less or slightly more thermal paste each time you apply a thermal compound, including variation on where that paste is actually placed on the IHS. The plexiglass test was a nice idea, but once we actually applied real mounting force to the thermal paste applications, it was clear just how much more spread you get from that retention kit. It pushes down a whole lot harder than you'd be able to do by hand. So once in a real world application, the plexiglass method doesn't really remain all that representative of what we're doing, but it's a nice idea for on-camera demonstration of how the compound spreads outward, and that's about it. It's good for seeing the process of spreading, but not good for seeing the final full spread, which is what these photos show. Only a few applications show notably different spread patterns between each of the application methods, and we can get into testing those next. Some basics on testing. We use the same mounting force each time, the retention kit, is pretty easy to work with. Torque drivers and things like that also make it easier. So same mounting force, same cooler, same thermal compound for all the tests from the same batch. Not that that's too relevant at that level. It's, it's not gonna be visible in, with our resolution anyway. Uh, max speeds on the Kraken X62. And then the voltages, we fixed the stock test to 1.2 volts. So it's, it's a little bit on the high side compared to out of box stock voltages, but it's stable and it doesn't change at 1.2, it just kind of sits there, which is what you want, because as voltage changes, the power increases or decreases and you have variance. Uh, we fixed it to 1.3625 for the overclock with a 40 multiplier. And then for logging, had uh, current logging via clamp at the EPS 12 volt voltage uh, monitoring and of the CPU that is, and then uh, ambient, all of which were aligned second to second in spreadsheets and then we could check for consistency errors or things like that in there. As I understand it, Threadripper has 36 sensors in it. So these things, they've got, well, they have a lot more sensors than that, but they have 36 relevant sensors to us. And those are placed all over the dies and inside the IHS. I, I did ask about this at the AMD event, uh, if they could give some examples of where they're placed within the IHS and didn't really get any concrete examples, just more of a, well, there's a lot of them. So they're pretty much everywhere. And that's fair. So. The sensors in here are averaged depending on how you, what software you use and how it works with it and if it even recognizes Threadripper. With Hardware Info 64, which is definitely the best one right now, uh, it creates a TDI readout and TDI is a collection of all those sensors averaged. So uh, I wish we could see them granularly because then you could, if you knew where they were, you could tell how the coverage is and the contact is for each specific die. But, uh, but this is good enough. So that's what we're using. We are also using Prime 95 28.5. 29.2 had some issues. We like to do 29.2 with uh, 8K sizes for the FFTs, but it just, it, there's some issue right now with 
either Threadripper or Prime. We're not really sure what. So we just used 28.5 because it worked reliably and the clocks didn't change that well at all, really. Uh, there is power cycling in Prime, so we account for that in the data and the spreadsheets and, and average it all out as necessary and get rid of any of the data that looks bad. So uh, we can roll into it now. Pretty straightforward, though. Assuming your ultimate goal is just to cover the whole IHS, it seems that application method doesn't too much matter as long as a sufficient amount of compound is located centrally. Our small blob test, we're calling it, uses a sparing amount of compound, the least out of all of these. We'll show that on the screen now if you want to see how much it was. And that managed to perform similarly to the ace attack pre-application and the double line pattern, which performed a bit worse than expected, honestly. The double line seemed like it could do a bit better. Our X pattern gave us the most overall coverage once we corrected the lines to better intersect the dies and ended up covering the entire cold plate of the X62. This gave us a measurable and repeatable difference of about two to three Celsius improvement, depending on which numbers you're comparing. This is pretty damn close to our error margins, though it skates by just barely. So more, we're, we're really close to being equal here. It's not enough to be a revelation. The only real reason the X pattern is performing well is because we've covered more of the cold plate, though there's a limitation to the efficacy of a spread as you start bumping into the seal boundaries toward the screws in the plate. Outward in the outer edges of the coolers, there's a seal and you, you're really not contacting anywhere there's microfins or even liquid anymore. In the very least, we're preventing air pocket hotspots from forming in those screw holes, which do sit right over parts of the dies, so that's always a good thing. Following AMD's application method recommended, we ended up closer to 44C, not that distant from the other tests, and also within error margins for some of its neighbors, or most of them even. It could be better. AMD's recommended application method actually is just fine as a method, but it leaves a whole lot of room for the user to play, and that's not necessarily a good thing. There's no reason that the five dots method recommended wouldn't work just as well as the others. It's just a matter of how much paste you apply. With larger dots, assuming it's not excessive, we should more or less match the performance of all the other application methods nearby. We followed AMD's guide as best we could, but there's room for bigger dots as always, and ultimately we're just comparing a video anyway, so hard to get depth there, but bigger dots would make it just fine. The most interesting test was the heavy blob method. We did two applications of this one, with the first using a significant amount of compound dead center of the Z in the word Ryzen. The second test used about maybe 25 or 30% less compound and still managed a 39.6 Celsius delta T over ambient average performance figure. The larger version of this blob operated at around 35 Celsius delta T over ambient, a significant performance uplift over some of our other test patterns like the five dot pattern with the smaller dots, and even the ace attack pattern, which is the silk screen applied one. Again, we think that this is just a matter of relying on the cooler's own mounting pressure to spread the compound out evenly across the IHS, rather than trying to manually spread the coverage. The downside is that you're sort of guessing at how much you need to cover everything because it's all being applied under the hood when you're tightening things down. That's the only real disadvantage to the blob method. It's easier to gauge coverage with an X, for example, or the parallel lines, and these recommended five dot method is also good for this, but we just have to use enough to make sure there's full spread outward with any of them, and we'll be fine. What's not shown here is our test without thermal paste, which resulted in clock throttling, as you might expect, and a very unhappy Threadripper CPU, but we were just curious. As for overclocking results, while we didn't have a good enough cooling solution to find a difference, the CPU is pushing 21 to 26 amps down the EPS 12 volt cables at this point, around 260 to 326 watts with that overclock, and so was running hotter than our Kraken X62 could reasonably handle in its stock state. It could handle it, it wasn't throttling at all, actually, but it's bottlenecked, so to speak, enough by being the weaker link than the thermal paste, so we're not gonna get a picture of how much thermal paste impacts things without a better cooler. We need a heavier duty cooler to get the thermals down to a point where the thermal paste difference is visible. If you're wondering why this chart doesn't have every single method we used in the other one, it's because it was pretty apparent what was happening by this instance in testing. No point in trying more methods when our cooler is clearly the limiter. So there's no perfect method. The only real conclusion here is that covering the whole plate, or at least most of the plate, is going to help out a bit. But as far as which method to do it, it comes down to how confident are you in the coverage of each application. If you feel better about the X, because that's what you use, and you feel like you can gauge that it's coverage and make sure it'll cover the relevant dyes, then go with it. But if you feel better about the blob, just use a whole lot of thermal paste dead center. It'll spread out and be pretty good. 
It's just a matter, again, of how much compound you use. There's no reason the X method or the uh, dual lines method or AMD's recommended five dots method wouldn't be just as good as any of the other ones. It's just you have to use a lot of compound. So personally speaking, my experience generally is with that blob method. I know how much to use to spread it across the whole IHS with all the older CPUs. So you just upscale it here and that worked out. If I had used more compound with any of the other ones, you'd probably see pretty similar performance, but uh, it just comes down to what you're used to. So relying on the cooler to spread things out is, it seems pretty good. It's a lot of force. You just put a big amount right in the middle and it'll squish all the excess outward and cover the whole thing, including the rest of the cold plate that isn't covered by the stock paste on the Azatec coolers. So what we're looking at next is where it really gets interesting with the full coverage cold plates, which we don't have any of those yet. But if you have something like the Noctua cooler with the full coverage plate or the EK water blocks one coming out soon, those instances might be one where it makes sense to manually spread the compound over the whole IHS because you actually have a plate that can contact every part of the IHS, whereas the one we're using right now only contacts the center. So if you cover the whole thing, you just end up with a lot of compound on the corners that never touches any cold plate, never touches any copper at all. But that's what we're looking at. So overall, not a huge difference in performance for a lot of these. It just comes all, the, the conclusion here is not blob is better. That's not what it is. It's more thermal paste is better within reason. So if you can cover the whole thing, then it looks like that'll be best for performance. Uh, one thing I'm not 100% sure about, but I, I'm kind of, I suppose uh, we could hypothesize about is that the holes, uh, the countersunk holes in the cold plate, being that they are deeper into the plate than the actual cold plate, could be producing hot spots of air when the thing's heating up because they do actually sit right over the dyes. So uh, that might be why we're seeing performance uplift in the scenarios where there's full spread over those holes as well. But that's it for this time. As always, patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. You can go to gamersnexus.squarespace.com for the store where you can get a shirt like this one or the one I wore in the first half of the video. So there's a day between them. Subscribe for more as always. I'll see you all next time. Today we are going to need a lot of thermal paste. God damn it. We were good the first time. <laughs>